Hello, my name is Saul Wiener, and this is the second in a series of videos on the topic of contextualizing care. If you haven't watched the first video, which is called What is Patient Life Context? I encourage you to do so. In brief, patient life context refers to everything that is going on in a patient's life that is directly relevant to planning their care. And I emphasize directly relevant because, of course, there isn't time during a busy encounter to know about everything that's going on in a patient's life, uh, even if you know them, and, and nor is it necessary. But if a patient is, uh, for instance, depressed, uh, and because of that they're not taking their diabetes medication, uh, you won't be able to manage their diabetes if you don't address the context of depression. And uh, similarly, if they can't afford a medication, uh, you're not going to be very successful prescribing that medication. Uh, you need to come up with some alternative plan, or again, your uh, care plan is not going to be very effective. So in this video, we're going to look at a four-step process for contextualizing care. And this four-step process has emerged from uh, work we've done uh, listening to thousands of audio recordings made by patients with their physicians. And we'll also be looking at how this uh, process can break down, uh, where clinicians can drop the ball, and you can end up with a care plan that uh, essentially looks good on paper, but is not likely to be effective uh, for that particular patient given the context. And when that occurs, uh, we call that a contextual error. So uh, thank you for your interest, and let's get started. As we begin our discussion of the four steps to contextualizing care, I'd like to begin with just a simple definition of the term contextualizing care. A care plan is contextualized when it considers patient life context. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, the term patient life context is discussed in the prior video. This table is also a review from the prior video, and it shows what we refer to as the 12 domains of patient life context, the ones on the left pertain to life circumstances, things that are going on in a person's life that could be relevant to planning their care. And then the ones on the right are drivers of behavior. Although we try to minimize jargon, there are four important terms I'd like to introduce to you here that will guide the discussion that follows. The first is a contextual red flag, and that's any clue that something in a patient's life situation might be relevant to planning their care. The second is a contextual probe, and that's any attempt by a clinician to inquire about a contextual red flag to find out what in the patient's life situation might be relevant to planning their care. The third is a contextual factor, and that's anything in a patient's life situation that is, in fact, relevant to planning their care. In other words, the patient's life context. And finally, a contextualized plan of care, and that's a care plan that takes contextual factors into account so that the care will be effective. Now, as you can see, I put an asterisk at the top for a contextual red flag after the word might. And the point here is that a contextual red flag doesn't necessarily lead to the discovery of a contextual factor. It's just a clue. It's a sign that there might be something going on in that person's life, and it's a sufficient enough clue that it warrants contextual probing. So if we remember back to the case from the first video, uh, of the woman we referred to as Ms. Garcia. Again, she was a 46-year-old who returned to the emergency room four times before uh, anyone uncovered the fact that she was missing her hemodialysis because of some life issues that the team could actually address. We see here how that narrative can be parsed into these four elements. First, there was the contextual red flag. Uh, again, in her case, that was just the frequent missed hemodialysis, which I should have been a clue to the team that something was going on. The second uh, w was the contextual probe. And again, that didn't happen until the fourth visit when a fourth year medical student finally asked her why she kept missing her hemodialysis. The contextual factor uh, was the story that emerged, which focused primarily on her caregiver responsibility for her grandson. And then the fourth was the contextualized plan of care, which is moving her hemodialysis to the same site as where her grandson uh, got his care. And again, that didn't occur until the probe, which was at the fourth visit. So now what we see is how this actually played out at the first, second, and third visit. There was missed hemodialysis, there was no contextual probe, and then because there was no probe, it was never discovered that she had this caregiver responsibility. And because of that, there was no contextualized plan of care. Whenever a contextual factor is overlooked, resulting in a missed opportunity 
to arrive at an appropriate plan of care. We refer to that unfortunate outcome as a contextual error. So a contextual error is defined as a care plan that is inappropriate because of a failure to consider patient life context. And operationally, it's caused by a failure to address a contextual factor in the care plan. There are three pathways to a contextual error. Uh, the first is the one we just looked at in the example of Ms. Garcia. So here, a clinician fails to probe a contextual red flag. As a result, the contextual factor is not revealed. And then as a result of that, the clinician plans care essentially unaware of the patient's life context. The second cause of contextual error occurs when the clinician actually does probe the contextual red flag and the patient subsequently does reveal a contextual factor, but the clinician then neglects to address the contextual factor in the care plan. And that might happen, for instance, when a clinician is preoccupied typing their note and doesn't process the patient telling them what it is that they're struggling with that's complicating their care. It might also happen if the clinician just doesn't know about available resources that they could use to contextualize a care plan based on the information provided by the patient when revealing the contextual factor. And then finally, there is the third scenario in which the clinician fails to probe a contextual red flag, but the patient nevertheless goes on to reveal a contextual factor without being prompted, essentially giving the physician a second opportunity to get the care plan right. But then, despite that, unfortunately, the clinician still neglects to address it in the care plan. So whereas the example of Ms. Garcia illustrated the first pathway to a contextual error, this slide and the one that follows illustrate uh, the second and third pathways. So here we see success at probing, but failure at addressing a contextual factor in the care plan. So the red flag is a patient with an A1C of 8.5. Uh, the patient goes on to say he hasn't been checking his sugars. Uh, the doctor asks, what's the hangup uh, with checking your sugar levels at home? So there's the probe. The patient reveals that he doesn't like poking his finger with a needle. It is also discovered that the patient is taking the wrong dose of insulin. So far, so good. However, at this final stage, the doctor drops the ball. Despite finding out why the patient hasn't been checking his sugars, in other words, eliciting the contextual factor, the doctor does not discuss preventing fingertip pain, for example, warming your hands first, lancing on the side of the finger, alternating fingers daily, and the provider also doesn't probe further as to why the patient was taking the wrong dose. So again, we end up with a no contextual plan of care. And then here, we have a failure to probe and a failure to address a contextual factor in the care plan. So in this case, a patient has lost a significant amount of weight since his last visit. The provider did not inquire as to what was going on in the patient's life. The patient went on to say that his wife had died four months ago and that she had been the one to prepare meals. Now that his wife was gone, he didn't cook or eat as he had before. And again, here we see a missed opportunity to contextualize the plan of care. Specifically, there's no discussion about how this patient could adapt to his situation, including grief counseling, cooking more, and becoming more socially engaged, potentially, such as inviting friends over to help and join in meals. So this is a flow diagram that outlines the various pathways that can occur during any physician-patient encounter in which there's a contextual red flag. The clinician can think of themselves as sitting in that rectangular box near the top. And the question is, do they probe the contextual red flag? There are two sources for contextual red flag. One is something the patient says, that's the oval on the left, and the other is something that's in the chart, and that's the oval on the right. So on the right, it could be a pattern of missed appointments or not refilling meds, and on the left, it could be something the patient has said, such as, doc, it's been tough since I've lost my job. Now, ideally, the provider will elicit the red flag, and that points us to the green yes on the right, and the patient will in turn reveal a contextual factor. Now with the factor revealed, the final step is for the provider to incorporate that information into the care plan. And if those three things occur, we end up in the green oval at the bottom on the right, which is the contextualized care plan. Now you can see multiple pathways to a contextual error. It could occur because the physician fails to probe, because the physician fails to incorporate a contextual factor into a care plan, and it could occur despite a patient revealing a contextual factor when a physician neglects to incorporate that information into the care plan. Finally, I just want to point out there are two gray ovals on the left and the right 
that say contextualized care plan not needed. And that's to refer to situations where despite there being a contextual red flag, it turns out there's actually no contextual factor. So for instance, when a patient says something like, Doc, it's been tough since I've lost my job, and the physician correctly probes and says something like, well, you know, can you tell me more about that? Are you having trouble paying for your medications? Has this affected your insurance? The patient might respond, no, no, doc, that's not what I meant. I'm fortunately on my wife's health plan. It's just been a real bummer having to look for work. Were that to happen, we would say that although there was a contextual red flag and it was appropriate to probe, no contextual factor emerged. So in sum, I think it's helpful to recognize that if you're a clinician and you're in the room with a patient and that patient has some sort of contextual issue, you're going to go down one of these pathways, regardless of whether you do a good job or a bad job. And the path to getting it right is to probe those contextual red flags, elicit contextual factors, and incorporate them into your plan of care. And finally, I'd like to mention a limitation that may have occurred to some of you, and that's that the four-step process that we've adopted for contextualizing care could miss situations in which there are no clues that a patient is struggling with life issues complicating their care and when they don't disclose any concerns. Now, we chose years ago to adopt an approach that relies on these clues, these contextual red flags, simply because we recognized that most medical encounters are significantly time constrained. As a result, we thought it would be unrealistic to develop a system in which the expectation is that a clinician would elicit a comprehensive panoramic life review for every patient during every encounter. Now, that's not to say that we don't support efforts to collect additional information if possible. So for instance, screening for social risk factors can be very helpful. But we found that busy clinicians appreciate our approach because it acknowledges the constraints under which they operate. And nearly all of them recognize the indisputable importance of looking into overt clues that a patient is struggling. So a couple of key points for review. First, that contextualizing care is a four-step process. Um, as noted, it begins with contextual red flags, clinicians probing those flags for context, patients revealing contextual factors, and clinicians and patients creating a contextualized care plan. And again, you can see here how some of this is the work of the clinician, some of this is the work of the patient, and some of this is a collaborative process. And then secondly, contextual errors occur when there's a failure to probe or to address contextual factors or both, uh, resulting in care that is inappropriate because it does not take into account patient life context. So I hope this quick introduction to contextualizing care and its nemesis, contextual error, has been helpful to you and that it will entice you to move on to the third video, which will begin to look at some of the research and science behind this framework. And as always, thank you for your interest. <laughs>